essentially, this book covers uh, in the main the period from 2011 to 2013. And then towards the end, it looks um, to a certain extent at um, events thereafter down to 2020, roughly. Um, and the cover um, has a couple of religious scholars and a political figure. Um, who will, they will be familiar to um, some of the audience, no doubt. Um, this is, uh, you know, a very prominent um, crown prince in the region, Mohammed bin Zayed, the uh, rule, de facto ruler of the UAE. Um, this is Yusuf al-Qaradawi, a now, you know, um, a scholar now well into his retirement. He was born in 1926, so he's in, uh, you know, he's 95 years old. Um, and this is a uh, another Egyptian scholar. Both of these scholars are Egyptian. Um, Ali Guma, who's about twenty years younger than Qaradawi, if I, if memory serves, about twenty five years. Um, and these two uh, figures pro uh, feature prominently as ulama. So hopefully, um, you know, the the term ulama will be familiar to most of the attendees. But for those who are less familiar, uh, it's the plural of the Arabic word alim. Uh, which means scholar, and uh, it usually is used to designate uh, sort of religious scholars in the context that we're talking about. And uh, in many respects, just to sort of like, uh, I should uh, give a spoiler alert here, but um, just to give away who's with democracy and who's with autocracy, as the subtitle says, uh, Qaradawi is um, what I would characterize as pro-democratic in his orientation and uh, Ali Goma, among the scholars here, is um, pro-autocracy, and this is one of the region, regional autocrats. So um, to go into sort of uh, the book, I've actually divided the book um, into a, 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 on a chronological basis. So it contains nine chapters, and I go um, chapter by chapter from the beginning of 2011 um, till uh, in chapter eight, uh, sort of going into uh, 2013, uh, into the summer of 2013 and its aftermath. And the first two chapters are actually ded dedicated to this um, chap over here, Yusuf al Qaradawi. as I say, born 1926, he will have been, he, he's in his 95th year right now. And um, he is, uh, even though I've given him two chapters, I'm only giving him one slide. Um, I think he's uh, uh, important and someone who does deserve two chapters, and I hope that people will um, sort of take the time to get their hands on the book and read those two chapters. But uh, he's an interesting figure, shall we say. He's very controversial um, in the post-Arab uh, revolutionary context because of the fact that he was a vociferous advocate for the Arab revolutions. And I think, um, you know, the, the fact that they have largely not resulted in a democratic transformation that was um, aspired to. In fact, the only sort of a reasonable success story, one could argue, uh, was um, sorry, was uh, the case of Tunisia, and even that, um, as we've seen over uh, the last few months, has gone into a, a, a downward spiral. You could say, um, though it is, yeah, I mean, it's it's um, largely gone into the hands of an autocrat. Um, but Qaradawi uh, was someone who had, throughout his career, um, quite um, strongly advocated for democracy. And he's one of the um, sort of few scholars associated with the Muslim Brotherhood, who is also a very, I mean, uh, the, a few members of the Muslim Brotherhood, who is also a very high ranking jurist. Um, he was a graduate of the Azhar. He was, uh, even though he was a Muslim Brotherhood activist during his time at the Azhar, and actually spent some time in prison uh, during his years in education, yet he still um, tended to excel in his academic um, classes. And he um, sort of performed very well in his undergraduate, the equivalent of his undergraduate, postgraduate, and his doctoral studies. Um, and so uh, I think the association with the Muslim Brotherhood makes him particularly controversial in the Middle East today because the Muslim Brotherhood, um, uh, they're somewhat polarizing in and of themselves, but they're also, um, the they exemplify, I think, the democratic threat in the region. Um, and uh, in the case uh, of the Middle East right now with the uh, resurgent autocracy, I think it's perfectly understandable that they would be 
uh, anyone associated with them would be also deemed um, sort of controversial. Whether that's justified or not, of course, depends on one's, um, you know, one's own position on, on various questions. Um, now, uh, as I say, he uh, was a forceful advocate in 2011, just as the Tunisian um, sort of uh, the, the background, of course, to the revolution of the revolutions um, of early 2011. Um, is the self-immolation of a Tunisian street vendor um, and his self-immolation uh, ultimately led and, and eventual death ultimately led to the overthrowing of the long-standing dictator of Tunisia, uh, someone known as Ben Ali, um, in January of 2011. Um, shortly thereafter, Qaradawi came out and he praised um, you know, the activists who uh, managed to oust the Tunisian dictator, and he um, uh, asserted that Tunisia should be an example for the rest of the Arab world. And um, I'll have a slide specifically on this, but Qaradawi is an Egyptian scholar based in Qatar, and Qatar at this point in time uh, had a ruler um, who would subsequently uh, abdicate his position and pass on the helm to um, his son. But that ruler was particularly activist in his foreign policy, wanting to advocate democracy throughout the region, even though um, there wasn't really any, uh, Qatar is itself an auto autocracy. And so there are some uh, very interesting and uh, ironies and tensions in Qatar's activism. But Qaradawi was given this, um, he, he's a long-standing advocate of democracy, and he was given a platform repeatedly on, on Al Jazeera, Qatar's um, sort of uh, globally recognized uh, media outlet. And um, within weeks, uh, the uh, revolutions reach um, uh, Egypt, uh, the most populous country in the Arab world at the time, maybe 90 million plus um, sort of uh, population. And um, <laughs> it's fascinating, all the commentators were, were just repeating, obviously, this isn't going to, Egypt's not going to fall, nothing's going to happen in Egypt, etc. And in 18 days, uh, the Mubarak regime falls. And there's excellent analysis um, from um, David Kirkpatrick, a New York Times journalist, who I think has written one of the most insightful books on the Arab revolutions. Um, it's called Into the Hands of the Soldiers. He wrote it, you know, late enough to see the actual consequences of a lot of these revolutions. And, um, you know, he, uh, he notes that uh, there were internal sort of uh, there was internal disquiet in the Egyptian military about the way in which um, the then dictator Hosni Mubarak was clearly grooming his son to take power, and that would have displaced the traditional power that the military has enjoyed since the revolution of 1952, um, which brought the military into uh, absolute power um, under Naguib and then Nasser. And so, um, you know, in a sense, uh, it wasn't ever really out of the hands of the military completely, the situation in Egypt, but it's, it's just um, what, what is worth highlighting here is that Qaradawi forcefully advocated for that revolution, but he also insisted that these are peaceful revolutions, and he said that there should be no violence, etc. Um, and it's a, it's a fascinating sort of, um, that, that commitment to peaceful revolution is also part of its, uh, part of the downfall of, um, arguably part of the downfall of the activists, um, as it were, not that I'm saying that violent uh, revolution is something to be called for, but um, there were certainly certain limitations to what could be done in the face of uh, military um, sort of uh, violence. Okay, so the next um, person, I'm, so that I, I dedicated a, a fair amount of time to Qaradawi because I, I dedicate two chapters to him. And I go through his legal reasoning, his justifications for the legitimacy of protesting against um, a tyrannical ruler, as he saw it. Um, and, uh, you know, all of that legal reasoning, we can perhaps uh, try and think about uh, in the Q&A. But uh, because, you know, we naturally have uh, a limited amount of time, I'm just going to go through the highlights here. The next chapter actually deals with three scholars in the main. Um, Ahmed al uh, who is the chap on the right, naturally, not, not the Pope. Um, but I've, I've used this photo quite deliberately because um, 
it kind of <laughs> illustrates the stature of someone like Ahmad al-Tayyib. Um, Sunni Islam doesn't really recognize papal kind of figures, but um, you know, if there is anything like a pope, um, perhaps Ahmad al-Tayyib is the closest thing to it because uh, he is the grand imam of al-Azhar, which is seen as the most, um, it's generally seen as the most uh, revered institution of um, Sunni uh, Islam. It's ironic because it was originally started as a non-Sunni institution. Now, um, I often tell students in my classes that uh, the Azhar is older than the University of Oxford, right? So it just gives you a sense of like the, the historical sort of um, depth of the institution. Um, but it's very much um, an institution under the uh, aegis control and suzerainty of the state. Since 1961, it was virtually nationalized. The Sheikh al-Azhar, as Malika Zeghal at Harvard has written extensively, is a political appointee, although that's been shifted a bit in the Egyptian constitution of 2014, uh, of 2012 and then 2014. But at the same time, uh, he has the rank of a minister. So, um, you know, he is part of the state apparatus. Um, and I think the 1961 transformations uh, place make that subordinate status very clear. Um, the Sheikh Lassa has managed to claw back a certain degree of independence, I think, in the 2012 constitutional shift um, sort of changes, which have been, with respect to the Asa, seem to have been preserved in 2014. So, um, but at the same time as being um, a, a figure who heads up the most important, arguably the most important institution of learning in the Sunni world, um, uh, he was also the uh, a member of the National Democratic Party, which was Mubarak's kind of um, in a sense, manufactured political party for the purpose of his, uh, you know, um, rule. And uh, he was a very loyal member of it. Um, he, he initially refused to uh, step down from that position when he was about to be appointed as the Sheikh al-Azhar because, um, you know, uh, the Sheikh al-Azhar is supposed to be non-partisan and, you know, that would have seemed to be the obvious thing to do. Eventually he relented and he did sort of like relinquish his formal membership, but he made very clear that he was still completely committed to Mubarak. And so, uh, you know, it's it's just worth bearing in mind that uh, he's a religious scholar, um, highly regarded, but also um, uh, very much an establishment figure. Uh, interestingly, and we can talk about this uh, a bit later, if you like, he has become something of a, uh, very ironically seen as someone, some very slightly oppositional towards Sisi. Um, and we can talk about why that is. I think it's because of Sisi's attempted overreach rather than much changing on the part of uh, the Sheikh al-Azhar. So in 2011, uh, the Sheikh al-Azhar comes out along with Ali Gumara, who we'll see in the next um, uh, slide, and uh, Ali al-Jifri, a Yemeni scholar, a student of Ali Gumara. So uh, Ali Gumara is um, another very uh, high-ranking scholar in Egypt at the time he was the Grand Mufti. They all came out and said, protesting uh, against Mubarak is haram, which is to say it, it is completely impermissible from a uh, Islamic legal perspective. And um, in 2013, he would, uh, I mean, we'll, we'll get to that, but he actually supports the ouster of um, the uh, Morsi um, administration, well, Morsi government um, in uh, conformity with the wishes of uh, General Sisi, now President Sisi. Ali Juma is the next figure. Um, again, I'll go through this reasonably quickly. Uh, he was uh, the Grand Mufti from 2003 to 2013. So he was the Grand Mufti during the 2011 period. He's, a, he's still a very prominent scholar. He's a bit younger than the other scholars we've seen so far, although he, I mean, he seems to have aged a bit. Um, and uh, he has actually a fairly um, broad audience outside of Egypt as well. Histori I mean, he's he's had a lot of students. Um, he's been a prominent sort of scholar um, and is seen as a great scholar by a, a very large number of students who, some of whom have expressed considerable disillusionment at his, you know, politics after 2011. And we'll deal with that. And finally, Ali al-Jifri, uh, the same photo. Um, Ali al-Jifri is basically much younger scholar, as you can see, he's born in 1971 about 20 years younger than, um, 20 to 30 years younger than the other scholars that we've seen. In fact, maybe 40 years younger than someone like Qaradawi, who's the oldest. 
and um, but he's very you know precocious politically savvy his father is characterized as an aristocratic Yemeni politician uh, who served as a key Yemeni frontman for Saudi Arabia according to some scholars and um, I think that political dimension of uh, Jifri is really has really been sort of has characterized his he, he is a political sort of uh, he's a very capable political animal from what it seems <coughs> and he sees himself as a student of uh, Ali Gomar so that's that's my third chapter the fourth chapter and I'm you know I basically talk about in the third chapter how these scholars support um, Mubarak opposed the protest against him and then they um, uh, in 2013 oppose Morsi and support the protests against him. Now those are two cases of fairly clear-cut opposition. Qaradawi is opposed to Mubarak uh, and autocracy and supports democratic government um, and the Muslim Brotherhood who win in the Egyptian elections of 2012. <coughs> and uh, uh, Ali Gumaa, it's pronounced Gumaa very often because he's uh, an Egyptian and the you know, the Egyptians pronounce the gene in that way. Ali Gumaa, uh, Ahmed al Tayyib, and um, Ali al Jifri are basically the opposite of Qaradawi, um, supportive of autocracy, opposed to you know the Muslim. They they describe it as opposition to the Muslim Brotherhood rather than uh, democracy. But then you have a, a couple of scholars who are somewhat ambiguous but nonetheless very influential and you know I, I picked these scholars because of their prominence and they continue to actually be quite prominent um, Qaradawi as I say is retired now more or less but the others still are very prominent in the public square in, in the Middle East. Uh, Hamza Yusuf is very interesting because he's not even a Middle Easterner. Um, many of the audience may be familiar with him he's a scholar based in California and uh, but he's a student of the next chap uh, this chap over here uh, Abdullah bin Bayya. And Abdullah bin Bayya has basically roped him into a lot of this activity in the Middle East. Um, so Hamza Yusuf was described as early as 2001. So 20 years ago, he was described as arguably the West's most influential Islamic scholar. Um, I think that statement is probably, you know, um, perhaps even more true um, today than it would have been historically. He's set up a very important uh, seminary. Um, I think, you know, one of the arguably one of the most important um, Islamic uh, seminaries in the Western world, uh, certainly in North America. And, um, you know, he has a very considerable following. Um, he's been a very prolific speech maker over the course of his career. Um, and now he's also, um, you know, a significant political figure in the United Arab Emirates in particular, but even in the United States. Um, and so, uh, you know, he um, actually expressed considerable enthusiasm for the ouster of Mubarak in 2011, something I, I describe as quite out of character in uh, in my book, um, considering his sort of previous statements. Um, but at the same time, uh, as making those sorts of statements, in perfectly in character was his comment uh, that, I mean, um, perhaps not perfectly in character, but somewhat in character, were, were his comments that, yes, Mubarak, uh, you know, needs to, it's good that he's gone, but um, democracy is a problem. Uh, you know, we don't need the destabilizing factor of democracy in the region. So he wrote a blog post, I believe, on the 7th of February, four or so days before Mubarak's ouster. And he said that, you know, Mubarak should go, but the uh, Egypt doesn't need the destabilizing factor of um, sort of democracy. And so there's this very curious and ambiguous position. Um, I'll speak about later his um, joining forces with Bin Bayya uh, as part of a counter-revolutionary institution set up at the UAE. But let me first um, shift to Abdullah Bin Bayya. So he's the other scholar discussed in chapter four. Um, here, this is uh, a picture taken from um, 24, after 2013, certainly, where, um, as you can see, he is being shown great admiration by uh, this chap over here, right? So that's the ruler of the United Arab Emirates. Um, I uh, sometimes describe him as uh, sort of an archetypal prince in the Machiavellian sense. So someone who recognizes the importance of religion actually in um, sort of keeping uh, tabs on one's um, sort of flock, as it were, um, on one subject, over one subject. So um, he does, I think, uh, 
engage in these sorts of activities where he's showing a kind of deference to religion. But, um, you know, it's very much the case, we'll see in the later um, slides, that um, it is an instrumental deference, so to speak. So Abdullah bin Bayya in 2011, incidentally, doesn't say anything towards the beginning at all. He's, he, I found no statements of his, um, very elusive comments where he, I mean, he basically posted on YouTube a video where he expressed his, uh, a recording of a statement he had made previously, uh, a few years earlier, where he had expressed his disquiet at the way in which, um, you know, unruly masses might actually cause problems if, you know, they're not guided by you know, um, uh, a leader of some kind. Um, what's interesting is in 2011, he was a member of something called the International Union of Muslim Scholars. This was based in Qatar and it was headed by Yusuf al Khalidawi. So, headed by a figure who was, you know, well known to be a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. And um, uh, Abdullah bin Bayah was a vice president of uh, this institution and he you know, publicly would describe Yusuf al Khalabawi for, you know, even in uh, successive years as a teacher of his. Um, he would use expressions like Sheikhana, um, uh, al Khalabawi, and, and so on. Um, and I suspect, you know, that's a, a mark of respect. Uh, uh, Khalabawi is a learned scholar. Um, uh, Abdullah bin Bayah is nine years younger than him. And so I suspect that it's got. Part, partly to do with the fact that, you know, he is showing deference to an older scholar. But in 2013, um, having been uh, the, a vice president at the International Union of Muslim Scholars, um, you know, for nine years at that point, he um, resigns shortly after the Rabah massacre. And we'll talk about that uh, a bit later. Um, so the United Arab Emirates, and let me speak a bit about the geopolitics uh, of the region. Um, you have a situation whereby, um, you know, the uh, the balance uh, is still, you know, somewhat like this. So you have the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt as three major powers um, in the region that are very forcefully advocating for autocracy and see the Muslim Brotherhood as an existential threat, which, you know, I, I think they are uh, in the sense that um, the Muslim Brotherhood through you know the through the activist wings but also through the ideological sort of like writings of people like Qaradawi in favor of democracy I think do reflect a kind of existential threat to dictatorship in the region um, and so uh, you know there's uh, there's uh, you know that divide between the UAE, Saudi Arabia and Egypt and uh, until sort of um, maybe 20 uh, you know the mid 2010s um, Qatar and Turkey would have been very much on the side of the Muslim Brotherhood in that sort of contest. Um, by now, you know, we're in 2021 now, um, the Muslim Brotherhood, I think, are often given safe haven in countries like this, but they're not supported in their activism. And I think this is, a, you know, Qatar went through an interesting transition in this regard in 2013 when it handed over from the very activist Hamad bin Khalifa to um, perhaps the far more pr pragmatic um, current Emir Tamim bin Hamad. Um, Turkey has, you know, um, been you know, as a democracy engaging in its own internal pragmatic decision making. But Turkey is another um, sort of ideologically. Uh, they have certain commonalities with, um, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood trend, uh, the ideological slash intellectual trend. And so it's, I think, understandable that there would be some commonalities. But again, they've kind of taken the back seat by 2021. And so um, uh, the some of the other divides, I would argue, is political repression versus freedom of speech. I'm saying some freedom of speech because, you know, the uh, irony is, uh, you know, Qatar and Turkey aren't exactly sort of havens of free speech either. Qatar, Qatar is not a democracy in the first place, so there's that. And Turkey uh, is, you know, has... Um, a, a bad reputation, shall we say, on the international stage when it comes to questions of like free speech. Um, but uh, they are um, both countries where there is considerable free speech when you compare to UAE, Saudi Arabia and Egypt in the political realm, for example. So, uh, you know, these are relative distinctions. 
Um, and, uh, you know, the state narrative would be uh, what you find in these sorts of countries in the political uh, dimension. And Al Jazeera actually is interesting in that, you know, they, it has, by the standards of, um, you know, places like UAE, Saudi Arabia and Egypt, considerable editorial freedom, even though that's, you know, rarely uh, directed inwards. Not, you know, not without uh, some minor exceptions, but it's net rarely directed towards Qatar. Um, autocracy versus democracy. Again, that's a dividing line which I've already alluded to is, you know, um, it's ironic uh, with respect to a place like Qatar. Um, but I, I think it's, uh, it's true that Qatar was, you know, very forcefully advocating for democracy in the wider region. One of the things I say is that, you know, um, I think that's a good, and even if it isn't itself a democracy, um, by promoting those sorts of values, um, it, you know, changes the nature of the conversation that is possible in the region. And presumably it will have to confront those sorts of questions at some point in the future as well, um, if it has any success on the ground. So um, I'm going to actually sort of uh, jump ahead because I'm a bit conscious of time. Um, I'm guessing I have around 15 minutes or so. Um, so 2013 comes along and you have this guy showing up and engaging in a military coup. And as you can see in the sort of wider seating, you've got this chap over here, uh, who is um, Ahmed Tayyib, the Sheikh al Azhar. And he's basically, he makes a two minute statement. I mean, it's such a short statement. I translate the entire statement in, um, if I recall correctly, chapter seven. And um, basically, uh, you know, he's, he's saying that uh, he supports the coup because it's the lesser of two evils. Um, and so, uh, actually, chapter five, I should know this. Now, uh, I, I translate that two minute statement. Now, the, um, he's not the only religious figure, interestingly. That's um, one of the leaders of the um, uh, Noor uh, party, which was the Salafi uh, movement's biggest political party. But the 2013 coup, you know, results uh, in some very serious, um, bloody crackdowns um, against. Um, supporters of uh, the ousted uh, President Morsi and uh, Human Rights Watch refers to um, the 14th of August as one of um, the massacres of the 14th of August as one of the world's largest killings of demonstrators in a single day in recent history. <laughs> it actually describes it as worse than Tiananmen Square, which is, you know, a very well known crackdown in China. Um, and it's so egregious that even Tayyip kind of expresses disquiet at the massacre. And he says, you know, I'm going to stay at home and I'm not going to engage uh, until, you know, things settle down or something like this. Um, I, I find those statements, you know, I can understand where he's coming from, but it's also somewhat sort of undercut by the fact that he actually supported the ouster of um, the, the previous president who had been democratically elected. And by contrast, you have uh, a number of scholars opposed to the, the coup. Um, this is a photo of Qaradawi. This is uh, his successor at the IUMS. So he's now, he retired in 2018. His successor is someone called Ahmed al-Raisuni, who also spoke out. And this is Ali al-Qaradaghi. Um, he is also an Azhari, even though he's from Iraq originally. And um, he also made, made statements in 2013 as the Secretary General of the International Union of the Muslim Scholars. And these scholars basically um, are very vocal in their criticism. And there are several prominent Azharis. Uh, I mean, I've mentioned these two are Azhari um, in a sense. I mean, there's a debate of how you define an Azhari, but um, there are a couple of Azharis who are quite well established um, within the institution, Hassan al-Shafi'i and um, uh, Muhammad Aymara, who are named on the screen, who also vocally um, criticize the coup while sitting in Egypt at great you know, risk to themselves. Um, but all of these people only advocate for peaceful protest. And, um, you know, it just illustrates the fact that they don't actually have any power. Um, once again, I'm not sort of suggesting that they should do anything else. Um, but I think they, to a certain extent, are also advocating peaceful protest, um, you know, partly because they believe that that's the only way to uh, approach this that's sensible, but also because um, you know, the, the, uh, the consequences of not doing so are uh, almost certainly going to be far worse for themselves as well and for those who, are, who they are supporting. Um, 
Um, I mean, they, you know, someone at Qaradawi always reflected the sort of moderate wing of the Muslim Brotherhood in any case, um, very different from the sort of um, debates that were taking place in the 1960s. Um, I'm in the process of translating, I mean, uh, hopefully submitting um, a translation of Qaradawi's critique of extremist tendencies that emerged out of the Nasser's prisons um, among uh, Muslim Brotherhood youths in the 1960s. Um, so he's always kind of reflected that kind of azhari ulama critique of, um, you know, youthful uh, irascibility, shall we say. Um, so that's opposition to the coup, but this is the chap who is the most vocal supporter of the coup. And I, I dedicate effectively two chapters to him, chapters, I want to say, um, six and eight. Um, so I, sorry, um, five and seven. So chapter five and chapter seven um, are largely discussing uh, Ali Guma's um, sort of support for the for the coup and then subsequently the um, Rabah massacre. In fact, you know, I, I, uh, his uh, support for these was so significant that I have actually translated in appendix two and three um, the full lectures that he gave on uh, before the Rabah massacre and then four days after the Rabah massacre. Um, in the first kind of justifying the use of violence and then the second sort of ex post facto justifying and, and in my uh, estimation celebrating the the use of violence against um, sort of uh, protesters at Rabah. And so you have um, like Guma is really quite an unusual uh, character in the realm of sort of Islamic scholar scholarship in my estimation. I, I, it's very difficult to find someone who's quite so uh, learned, but also quite so willing to instrumentalize their knowledge to uh, the to politically expedient ends with ostensibly very little sort of moral compunction of any kind. So, you know, he basically says um, to a private military gathering with maybe, a, a, I guess, um, several hundred, perhaps a thousand military cadets in the room, um, he he tells them and um, the sort of the orchestrators of the Rabah massacre, the Minister of Interior at the time, Mohammed Ibrahim, and the the general of the uh, military, uh, Sisi, were all present. And he basically said that you know um, God is your supporter, the Prophet is your supporter. Um, shoot to kill, right? Don't you know? Don't let anything stop you or prevent uh, you know make you hesitate when it comes to defending sort of like the um uh, uh defending yourselves against terrorists as he would put it um and you know the uh, the documentation and indeed the statements of the um sort of uh, spokespeople of uh, egypt um including the interior minister and others themselves was that um in the tens of thousands of um, protesters at rabah they found um i think something like 14 um, weapons uh, or 14 sort of like um, pistols and um, you know um, improvised guns of some kind um, so you know it wasn't that these were heavily armed groups but um, uh, Ali Goma basically presented them as such and uh, his sort of rationalization for the um, engagement in murder which has also been dealt with um, quite extensively by David Warren in his articles and book uh, on the topic, um, those rationalizations were very much sort of, they were extremely labored and they didn't really reflect um, practical reality. And you could see that he was basically trying to rationalize, do whatever he could to rationalize the, the uh, mass killings that had taken place, which had resulted, I mean, I actually engage in a, a broader estimate based on uh, other statements, but it's, Human Rights Watch said at least a thousand people died, and um, based on other evidence, I, I've said you know it could be more than two thousand people who've died, and so um, you know it's uh, it's quite quite a, a striking I think um, moment in Islamic uh, intellectual history as well uh, that scholar uh, you know uh, a a sort of a reputable jurist or up until then a reputable jurist would be engaged in that sort of thing now of course this also happens in other um, traditions of ethical thinking and legal thinking etc so we can think about the torture memos during the bush administration 
that came out of Stanford University um, Law School. Uh, I forget the name of the lawyer, but um, you know the people who are supposed to uphold the norms of uh, you know a legal system are basically instrumentalizing them to subvert them, and the entire sort of legal structure of the war on terror is to a certain extent you know a story of that as well. So this is not particularly unique, but I do think it's uh, it's quite sort of um, exceptional in in certain ways. Um, okay, so I I should really be wrapping up at this point. Um, I've already mentioned the Rabbi massacre. As I said, there were you know um, potentially thousands killed, um, and basically the military and the um, sort of security forces came in with full force. And there's a you know I, I draw on it, but there's a kind of terrifying narrative of this in David Kirkpatrick's book, which is actually. Like the day that Rabbi Massacre happened, being the kind of fearless journalist he is, he drove into uh, Nasser City and he entered the sort of entered Rabbi so that he could document it from the inside. So he's actually in the midst of them all dodging uh, bullets and things like that. It's really quite a, um, a surreal narrative to read. And uh, if you're interested in sort of the one uh, you know, the post-mortem a year later, this is Human Rights Watch is all according to plan, really sort of um, uncomfortable but necessary reading. Um, I also, in chapter eight, I want to say, I, I look at condemnations of the Rabbah massacre specifically, and I dedicate a few pages to this scholar. I'm very, he's got a fascinating and extremely poignant sort of sermon that he gives that is reminiscent of a uh, scholar, Sheikh uh, Kishk, a very well-known orator from the Azhar. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so so that's, um, uh, if, if you're interested, you can have a read. I've rendered quite a bit of that sermon into English, actually. Um, and uh, for those of you who know Arabic, you can watch it in Arabic. I mean, it's quite an impressive uh, piece of oratory, but it's also uh, an instance of a, a scholar sort of engaging a live political issue. Um, which uh, you know has its own sort of like um, uh, intriguing sort of moral dimension in my estimation uh, but at the end of the day all of these scholars basically are moralists at this point with no power and so um, you know that's something to bear in mind in all of this and then in chapter nine you know I uh, this is the final sort of substantive chapter where I basically try and take on some of the secondary literature on this um, question of what explains the <coughs> the scholarly support given to the coup and i critique a you know a perspective which seems fairly widespread um though thankfully not universal in my view um among uh, sort of uh, scholars writing in english uh, that this is a reflection of the sunni um sort of doctrine of quietism political quietism and i you know drawing I draw on both primary and secondary literature, although in the book um, I've got mainly secondary literature that I'm dealing with. In other places I've written a bit more about this using primary literature as well, and I'd like to expand on it further. But, you know, it's not really a sustainable argument in my view, um, even based on the secondary literature. And I, I draw extensively on Michael Cook's book, Commanding Right, Forbidding Wrong, to show exactly why it's not sustainable. And I think this is my final, oh, almost penultimate slide. Am I doing okay for time? Uh, do let me yes. know if I... Oh, you're fine, you're fine. Perfect. And so um, I guess uh, I have a, a section in chapter nine where I talk about the failure of democracy and the rise of ISIS. And I, I twin those. Um, I'm following, I'm not sort of unique in this. Uh, David Kirkpatrick makes this point and also uh, Jean-Pierre Filou. Uh, a very brilliant French, uh, retired French diplomat who is also a scholar, uh, sometimes based at um, Colombia, it seems, but uh, based mainly in France, who uh, has written a, um, a, an excellent book called um, From Deep State, sorry, From Deep State to Islamic State, writing about ISIS. And, um, you know, both scholar, well, both uh, David Kirkpatrick, the New York Times journalist, and uh, Jean Pierre Filou. Um, point out that really it's the failure of democracy which has been systematically engineered by you know certain um, political actors in the region with the support of you know scholars like these uh, those at the top that you know um, gives rise to uh, groups like ISIS um, and I actually see them as kind of mirror images of each other in the sense that they need each other to survive um, and 
uh, what you have now with uh, uh, Hamza Yusuf and Bin Bayya, uh, they've basically established a, okay, I missed this slide, it seems. Uh, they established um, something called the Forum for Promoting Peace in Muslim Societies. It didn't have enough space for the full title. It's a uh, you know, very nice sounding name, but you know, it's, it's set up by the UAE as a mechanism to uh, legitimate sort of um, autocracy. So, you know, it, instead of calling it Forum for the Legitimation of Autocracy, obviously that's not quite so sellable. Um, it's always nice to refer to, you know, peace. Uh, that's something which will, um, you know, uh, that does the job when it comes to um, uh, the PR side of things. And so I, I see this as a kind of PR tool on the, on the the um, in the repertoire of the United Arab Emirates, which is, uh, despite its small size, a remarkably uh, effective um, geostrategic player. And so they have, you know, taken Bin Bayya in, um, set him up as their, effectively their Grand Mufti. Even though he's a Mauritanian based in Saudi Arabia, um, he now has, I, I think he may have been given uh, uh, Emirates citizenship, and he has a home in the United Arab Emirates, and he's basically um, you know, a political appointee of theirs as their Grand Mufti, and he heads up the Forum for Promoting Peace in Muslim Societies. He's roped in Hamza Yusuf in all of this as his, you know, one of his major students, um, and, you know, his most prominent student in the West. And so, you know, the two of them just last year, for example, ratified, I mean, uh, the, the, four, uh, the, the Emirates Fatwa Council, which they both uh, sit on, uh, sit on the committee of and which is chaired by Bin Bayya, ratified the normalization with Israel by the United Arab Emirates uh, on religious grounds and also um, declared the Muslim Brotherhood terrorist organization. And so, um, you know, Hamza Yusuf is very interesting because I think he may have issued a statement saying, I am a supporter of the Palestinians, but he never actually um, condemned the normalization of Israel. So he had a situation where. Um, his institution, the um, sort of Emirates Fatwa Council, issued a statement saying that uh, it is, you know, the the wisdom of uh, the Crown Prince that, uh, you know, sees this normalization of Israel, uh, and, it, you know, he's entirely in his rights from an Islamic perspective to do so. Um, so on the one hand, that's happening, uh, a statement from uh, an organization that, uh, um, Hamza Yusuf is one of a, short, a relatively small number of members of. And on the other hand, because of the backlash he was receiving from uh, you know, his community in the United States in particular, in the West more generally, um, he issued a statement saying, I've always been a supporter of the Palestinians. So there's a, you know, this is, um, in a sense, uh, these are the um, dangers of you know, entering the political field. You, are placed in untenable positions, but he's given no signal whatsoever that he is going to resign his post uh, at the UAE. Um, there seem to be um, strong suggestions that he, um, you know, his institution, an extremely important institution, has uh, is uh, it has been financially uh, supported by the UAE, um, and so uh, you know those relationships really, um, I, I think, um, are both complex and you know morally extremely challenging um for the american muslim community and for you know these figures as individual scholars as well um and so uh, i guess that's my last slide i mean the conclusion of the book has a few reflections um and uh, i you know uh, I, I guess i can I'll, I'll just summarize these reflections very briefly but uh, i hope that you know these conclusions are some useful insights um, for people who are trying to understand what's, you know, what happened with Islamic scholarship in the context of the Arab revolutions. Um, one thing I argue is the Islamic tradition is capacious, it's vast, and it can be drawn on by people to argue in very different ways. And so the Islamic tradition offers resources to both pro and counter revolutionary scholars. Um, and in my estimation, at least, although I didn't. I don't set out to sort of detail these arguments in a systematic fashion. I find the pro-democracy scholars more persuasive. Um, but <laughs> although I consider the sort of pro-autocracy scholars not to have as cogent arguments as um, the pro-democracy scholars, uh, those uh, scholars who support autocracy are backed by powerful military dictatorships. <clears throat> and 
um, ultimately in in the international arena, power trumps um, ethics, as it were. Uh, but at the same time, given the weakness of the ideological arguments presented for autocracy, I think Islamic democratic ideas will continue to pose a threat to the region's autocrats. And that's the hopeful note on which I can conclude. I hope that's been uh, useful and interesting. <laughs>